leader in the cast of The Tick, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Before we dive into the show, just for the few people out there that may not be uh, familiar, I, I'm going back a big fan of this concept. I've told you uh, in person we met before, we did this in San Diego. One of my favorite mo things ever created, favorite <laughs> ideas ever put to paper, is uh, Chairface Chippendale writes his name on the moon. Right. For those unfamiliar, it was a storyline in <laughs> The Tick where Chairface Chippendale, who literally looks like he sounds, his big plan was to write his name on the moon. <laughs> that touched me so much. After years of reading superhero comics where the bad guy was always out to do something really right. I was like, well, that's not bad. <laughs> it's actually kind of understandable. For those at home who are unfamiliar with the secret origin of the tick, which is something that charms me as a comic book store owner, oh, yeah. tell us about it, Ben. How it began. Um, well, uh, yes, I was... Uh I was uh, in a D&D &D group, and one of the people in the D&D &D group was actually uh, the manager of a local comic book store. I had been drawing and fooling around with a character for a while, and uh, he just told me that they were looking into publishing. This was a few stores, like this few towns away from where I grew up, and was just a kind of, a, I, my brother drove me over there, I showed my samples, and basically within the next year they uh, we kind of I started to draw for them and they uh, New England comics just asked me to begin working on this character that was a sort of mascot for the store uh, that I created asked me to create a comic book for it and uh, I spent you know what was supposed to be my college education figuring that out and uh, made the first issue and then it just took off it how just long took before off. it moved to animation when, and when did that happen somebody uh, come to you or did you believe this could be a cartoon well I mean uh, it was uh, it had just come out on the heels of that sort of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle phenomenon so there was a sort of a map in everyone's eye in everyone's heads about how this could work we never quite did it the same way as they did but we benefited from like the comic was out for about two years and we started to get calls from people that wanted to see that same thing happen we eventually got onto uh, Fox Kids Network and were able to do a very strange, not very marketable show that really didn't turn into merchandise. It just turned into a really fun, freeing uh, experience for about three years. And that just, I'm glad it went that way, actually. So you think with that, you're like, all right, that's the most I can get out of this. That's I've, it. I've ridden the tick as far as the I could. The rapper is empty. Exactly. <laughs> and then there's another TV show that happens yeah. first. Yep. So there's a little more gas in the tank, and then that doesn't go any further, and then you're like, the tick is definitely dead. This has got to stop. The, <laughs> we, we thought possibly, and I really did think possibly, uh, you know, some kind of ice capades or musical uh, in, interpretation would be cool, <laughs> but that, that we're still, now we're sitting here, we have this incredible, lustrous cast, and we have a, a new vista, really, that we can explore. That's amazing to me, and really, freeing it speaks well to the 21st century in my opinion you're not kidding man it also speaks well like anybody at home going like i got a cool idea yeah. like you took a cool idea that just started off as something to do for a comic book store and years later yeah it's still a big part of your life yes it hasn't been a part of all your lives nearly as long yeah. so let's go into the cast how do you come into this and is there ever a moment where you're like man nah, this isn't for me let's start with peter uh hello yeah. Hi. Uh, you know, you're talking about Chairface Chippendale. That's, this was something I found out like later on after getting the, uh, after getting the scripts and I saw all the, the amazing characters that Ben had created. And, and, and with that one in particular, that was my favorite too. And, and it made me think, I just wish JFK hadn't died because <laughs> if he'd lived just maybe 15 years longer, he would have read that and then that would have been his mission, you know? He would... To put Char right. on the moon. We choose to write Chef Chippendale's <laughs> name on the moon. <laughs> Not because it is easy, but because it is silly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, I, did, I wasn't really that familiar with the, with the comics. Uh, very peripherally, I, I was. And it's, it was... Uh, talking like Yoda now, very peripherally I was. <laughs> and um, the, uh, uh, but, but once I, once I read uh, 
just even like the first couple of issues, I was like, wow, this is really good. Why do they want me to ruin this? Um, but um, anyway, look, could everybody be quiet, please? <laughs> so noisy. Geeks are so noisy. Um, anyway, hello. Someone hey, else. Hello. We'll go to Jackie. Was, I mean, well, you've got a long history in this business. Uh, you've also got a history playing a quasi-hero in, in The Watchmen as Warshock, of course. Uh, you've got Preacher to your credits as well. I imagine no-brainer for you to dive into The Tick. Well, it was uh, tough at first because I submitted myself for the role of The Tick. <laughs> and, you know, I said, if this is a new iteration, what if it's a short little guy, you know, with the really small antennae that move much quicker? And, uh, but he's, you know, Ben called and said, no, I'm thinking more of the terror. And um, I read this screenplay. I never heard of The Tick before, but I immediately checked with my friends, my geek friends. And right. like you, you know, they absolutely love The Tick. Um, they loved the cartoon. They loved the TV show. They read the, all the books. And they were like, dude, you got to do it. It's really right. good. And I, when I read the pilot, I could immediately tell that Ben, you know, has evolved this thing, you know, and, and that it was perfect timing for this iteration. Um, it's, it's now, it's the first time that it's actually a parody of comic book movies. And what was neat about it was, a, it was a fascinating character, you know, a 140 year old evil dude. Um, but who plays drums as well. Yeah, who plays drums. But what was interesting to me, and you, it was apparent in the pilot that it wasn't just gonna be this silly romp. It was very hysterical, but there was character development and stories um, curve that you can see was being introduced into the pilot. So it was really gonna be, you know, it was going to be hysterical, but also give us story and great character development. So I was really excited to participate. Scotty, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I had been familiar with the cartoon uh, growing up and the live action, um, the original, the first live action, the early 2000s, I really enjoyed. Uh, but going back to what you said about is there something about like, is it ever like too much or something? I, 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 I had every experience every time we'd get a script, which is sometimes the night before we started shooting the episode. That, that did no judgment. Um, but sometimes the night that, after we finished yeah, filming. Yeah, sometimes the, the script would come. At, yeah, at the end of the day after we shot the scenes of that episode. That has happened. Yeah, uh, but there there was always a place at some point in every single episode that I got that I would read, and I'd have first I'd laugh. And then I'd have a, I can't believe that that is it, that idea, that moment, that talking dog thing, or this is happening in the script that they're about to shoot and spend money on. <laughs> and then I'd go back to laughing again. And it, every single every single script, there's a moment like that. I'd read it, and and that just it got me more excited every single time we're shooting. Val, uh, like Peter, peripherally I was. Um, uh, I sort of grew up when the cartoon was on. It was like a Saturday morning cartoon a lot of people would watch, and I didn't. Um, so, but I knew what it was. And uh, when I, I, I got the script, and, um, and they, they wanted me to look at Dot, and I was very confused why they would want me to be on this show, because I'm, I, I don't have the, the rich comedy background that everybody around me does, and I thought it was this very absurd comedy. And I'm, and I'm reading it, and then Ben and I sat down, and uh, we had coffee for about an hour in New York. And if you have the opportunity to talk to Ben Edlin for an hour or like 30 seconds, like take it. He has the most unique, fascinating brain and world. Very sweet. Um, if you can engage with that, I highly recommend it. Um, but he made it clear to me that what he wanted was he wanted Dot to be treated very seriously and was going to give me permission to play her dramatically um, because he wanted that vulnerability. He wanted the history. He wanted her to... Um, be more fully dimensional than she had been in previous iterations. Right. Um, and so that's what excited me. And I think also just the challenge of trying to to maintain that within the most bizarre world. Um, and it has been a challenge uh, to, to to play Dot in certain conversations with certain people. Um, but uh, but it's it's just been the best. That's all. Nice. Griffin, you get to pop the wings on the show, man. You're Arthur. What was that like when somebody was like, you get to be Arthur? Uh, it's like being told you get to be Robin or yeah, Silent Bob really or something that like yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I was a big fan of The Tick going in. Uh, 
My, my mom wouldn't let me watch the cartoon show when it was on because she was very overprotective. <laughs> she didn't let me watch any superhero stuff, which really cast the die for me later when I gained independence and only wanted to read and watch superhero right. stuff. If they keep us away from it, we'll just flock know, to it in right. adulthood. Yeah, then I'll have to make a career out of it. Yeah. Um, but I got really into it when the, the Warburton show was airing and uh, then went back to the cartoon and read the comics and became a massive fan. So it was this character that was like incredibly iconic for me that I cared a lot about. It's still very surreal. Like, uh, answering this question right now on a stage talking to you at a convention feels like a thing I fantasized about when I was like 13 in my bathroom mirror. Um, you know, that, that sense of uh, uh, excitement for what you get to do, but feeling totally overwhelmed and stressed out by the stakes is what Arthur's going through. What I was feeling as an actor, as Griffin, getting to play this part, always tracked directly onto Arthur, trying not to get shot in the face. Right. You know, and still somehow save these people. So it, it was a pretty, I barely act on this show. They just said, don't mess this up. And I went, oh, okay, not in the face. Yeah, that's all I did. Yeah. It's a lot of reacting, but reacting is right. acting as well. Exactly. Take it from a guy who doesn't get to speak in movies. Like We're doing good. Yeah. Twice. They would just throw me out a window and then they CGI the wings in later. <laughs> Um, wait, so the first half of the season uh, dropped, but the, they just announced you guys are coming back when? February? February 23rd, there's going to be the second half of the season, which we call 1B. But basically, yeah, another six episodes will drop, and like the first, uh, it's like the first two books of The Tick in season one. So, like, the first part we've seen, Arthur's wings spread, The Tick and Arthur begin their quest. Like, we, we've got another full. Uh, solid uh, meal for people to have on February 23rd. There's a trailer that they dropped. I think we'll probably be seeing it uh, when great. we go to break in the show. It's really good and oh, it, just, cool. it shows the wings popping and yeah, everything like yeah. that. Um, I dig it. The show's fantastic. I, I can't wait to dive back in. But before we yep. go anywhere, I'm just going to, I got to point this out. Like, this is a huge moment for me uh, to be on stage with Jackie. One of my favorite movies of all time that shaped me as an individual is The Bad News Bears. I agree, I agree. You know what I'm saying? He was the coolest kid in the world. You were the coolest kid. He's Kelly movie. Leak. Like, like yeah. that's, that's who he is. So I love that movie as a child. If you, uh, I, I think it still holds up today. It I still agree. absolutely works. But I saw it at age six in 1976 and I was telling Jackie backstage like, uh, this is huge for me because that movie like taught me to be who I was because at the spoilers at the end of that movie <laughs> the kids lose and nowadays if you make a movie you know everyone wins and everyone gets a trophy right. but like in 1976 like you went on a journey with these kids that shouldn't have went where they went and they got to the heights and in movies generally that gets rewarded and everyone yep. goes home happy but that movie didn't it literally taught an entire generation it's okay to lose. Yeah. Like, you don't always get to win. It's impossible. And yeah. sometimes the coolest people are the losers. So I got to thank Jackie. I was like, you made it fine for me to be a loser my <laughs> whole life, man. So thank you for that, man. Give it up for the creator and the cast of The Tick, ladies and gentlemen. 